Citizens, Not Politicians ballot campaign. Um, I'd like to have my colleagues at the ACLU of Ohio briefly say hi and, and introduce yourselves uh, as we're getting started. So I'll just call on people. Um, Cindy. Hi, everyone. My name is Cindy Tom. She, her pronouns. I am the development director. Uh, Colin. Good evening, everyone. I'm Colin Marazzi, he, him, and I'm the deputy policy director. Uh, Freda and then Elizabeth. Hi, everybody. I'm Freda Levinson, she, her pronouns. I'm the legal director. Hi, everyone. Glad to be with you this evening. My name is Elizabeth Chastine Day. I use she, her pronouns, and I am the organizing director. Thank you all, and thanks to everyone for joining us again this evening. Um, we're very excited to provide exciting updates about Citizens Not Politicians, which is an incredibly important uh, campaign, uh, grassroots campaign, working to place a constitutional amendment on the November ballot of this year to end gerrymandering in Ohio. So gerrymandering, no matter what policy issue is most important to you and your families and your communities, succeeding with meaningful redistricting reform must rank up there among your top concerns. Because until we end the practice of grotesque gerrymandering <laughs> in Ohio, we will never have a responsive legislature that is concerned about the issues that everyday Ohioans care about and are concerned about. Until we win redistricting form, reform, politicians and not citizens, unfortunately, they will remain unaccountable to us as voters and to the top concerns that we want them and we need them to address. So as a founding member of Citizens Not Politicians, the ACLU of Ohio has long been a leader in the redistricting arena, advocating for fair maps in the streets, at the state house, and in federal and state courthouses for many years. Redistricting reform is critical to the future of Ohio. We see this ballot campaign as a natural progression of the huge ballot victories that we saw last year in 2023 to protect democracy in August. That, remember that special August 8th election to preserve one person, one vote, and also to enshrine abortion rights into our state constitution, a huge victory that we uh, prevailed on in November. This campaign, Citizens Not Politicians, will be phase three of Taking Back Ohio, a perfect trifecta, we like to say, when we win this November. Our extremely gerrymandered legislature is the root cause as to why we need to take issues of importance like this directly to the ballot in the first place. A very expensive proposition, a time consuming proposition, because we have an unresponsive gerrymandered legislature. Because we, the people, are not fairly represented at the state house. And the policies that we need, the policies the legislatures enact instead, do not reflect voters' views and opinions on critically important issues from reproductive freedom, voting access, LGBTQ rights, criminal legal reform, gun safety, uh, environmental concerns, whatever you are concerned about, that is affected by redistricting and so much more. Citizens Not Politicians puts the power back in our hands as citizens, as voters, and we must have the right to choose our representatives and not the the other way around. So to provide critical updates this evening, again, I'm joined by my colleagues, Freda, Colin, Cindy, and Elizabeth. And I'm now gonna tur turn uh, to kick it off uh, to our brilliant legal director, Freda Levinson, who will provide some context as to the ACLU of Ohio's involvement in redistricting over the past many years. Freda? Thank you, Ben. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. <clears throat> Excuse me. So partisan gerrymandering is, of course, to draw political districts in a manipulative way, to rig the outcome of elections to favor one party over the other. And it's long been a problem in Ohio. Both parties have been guilty of the practice. They've both done it whenever they've gotten the chance. When they're in power and they're holding the drawing pen, neither one seems to be able to resist 
the temptation to manipulate the process to try to perpetuate their power. So now obviously it's become an even more serious problem in recent times because of incredibly rich data about voters and the power of supercomputers to process this data so effectively that election outcomes are just locked down for a decade, for a decade at, the time, at the time. Citizen groups have tried relentlessly over the past 40 years, if you can believe it, to put a stop to gerrymandering by trying to pass amendments to the Ohio Constitution. Over the years, a few amendments have passed and most have failed. Ultimately, in 2015, a major amendment was passed with bipartisan support and over 70% of voters approving to reform the process to draw state legislative maps. Then a few years later, in 2018, another amendment passed with the same level of support to reform the drawing of congressional districts. Both amendments created processes that depended on political bodies to do the work, the state legislature and the state redistricting commission. The state Supreme Court was given jurisdiction to review and strike down the maps if they were bad, but never to actually draw any remedial maps. All the court could do was reject maps repeatedly if necessary and tell the drawers to try again. Nevertheless, although it seems terribly naive now, the state celebrated the passage of these amendments and many people had great optimism and thought they'd finally slain the Jerry monster. Now these 2015 and 2018 amendments, although they were enacted mid-decade, by their terms, they wouldn't take effect until after the 2020 census. So they would govern the drawing of the 2021 maps. That meant that meanwhile, until the amendments took effect, Ohioans continued to suffer under some of the most egregiously gerrymandered districts in the country. The map had been very lopsided across that entire decade. The Republicans held 75% of the districts, despite winning only 51 to 59% of the votes. Moreover, shockingly, in all of the elections for all of the congressional seats that took place from the inception of that map through 2016, that's nearly 15, 50 contests for seats, not a single seat changed hands. So in 2018, we, the ACLU of Ohio, filed suit in federal court before a three-judge panel, and we won. Paul Moki, who's here in the audience, co-counseled with us on this case. The panel agreed unanimously that the Ohio General Assembly, controlled by a Republican supermajority, had violated the United States Constitution by gerrymandering, and it ordered the General Assembly to draw a new fair map. Unfortunately, around the same time, similar cases in Wisconsin and Maryland came up on appeal before the US Supreme Court, and the court ruled that political gerrymandering was not justiciable in federal courts. It said challenges against political gerrymandering had to be brought under state constitutions in state courts. So in 2019, our great victory was snatched away but by that point, it was 2019, so there was nothing to do but pin our hopes on the strength of those 2015 and 2018 amendments to the Ohio Constitution that were waiting in the wings, about to be implemented. We were about to see how the Ohio Legislature and Ohio Redistricting Commission would draw maps following the 2020 census. So as we now know, Despite the new amendments, the Ohio Redistricting Commission and the Ohio General Assembly conducted business as usual. They brazenly ignored the gerrymandering prohibitions. Both bodies were dominated by Republicans and passed maps that perpetuated the Republican gerrymanders from the previous decade. If anything, the newly enacted maps were even more skewed and unfair than the previous decade. We, the ACLU of Ohio, filed lawsuits against both maps with the League of Women Voters as lead plaintiff, joined by the A. Philip Randolph Institute and several individual voters, we filed in the Ohio Supreme Court. The Ohio Supreme Court held in both cases that the maps were drawn in violation of the Ohio Constitution's new requirements. The court said they were 
infused with partisan bias. So the court ordered the commission and legislature to draw new maps, which they did, but those maps were still gerrymandered. And so we challenged those. This process repeated itself multiple times, ad nauseum, wash, rinse, repeat. We kept winning. At first, the commission and the legislature drew maps that were slightly improved, but still not compliant. But later, their behavior deteriorated. Finally, in total defiance of the court, after the last few orders, they didn't even lift a finger towards passing a new map. So time was ticking away for the November 2022 election. By playing out the clock, the partisans in control were able to keep unconstitutional maps in place for that November 2022 election. By that time, we had challenged five straight rounds of state legislative maps and two rounds of congressional maps, and we won every time. In the November 2022 election, the Ohio Supreme Court flipped to become a majority of Republican justices who had widely announced that they were unwilling to apply the 2015 or 2018 amendments to strike down any map. Basically, they, re they read and read the amendments to not require proportionality, but only to require compliance with technical boundary drawing rules, which because of the superpower of computers can be adhered to, but you can still achieve uh, completely manipulated maps. So obviously, Ohio's current redistricting provisions don't have what it takes to get the job done. Their fatal flaw or flaws are the provisions depend on partisan politicians to obey the will of Ohioans, to obey the law, and obey court orders. But Ohio's politicians have shown us they they just can't stop acting like political animals. Yes, they did reform the maps a little, but when they learned they could ignore the law and the court and could do so with complete impunity, the process came to a grinding halt. And incidentally, this has happened previously in Ohio history in the DeRolf school funding litigation, where three times the Ohio Supreme Court ordered the state legislature to come up with a new equitable and adequate public school funding formula and the legislature just balked. That never happened. The, the legislature never, legislature never passed a compliant formula. A court typically has the power to hold in contempt parties who disobey its orders, but how do you hold an entire legislature in contempt? What army does the court have to throw hundreds of legislators in jail? When the people in power won't obey the law, the ordinary norms of our society just fail. We need a different process here a process that doesn't depend on politicians to rise above their own partisan interests and that doesn't expect them to obey a higher calling. We need to take politicians out of it. We need a map drawing body that's independent, not beholden to or controlled by any political party and a review process run by nonpartisan actors. And we need a review process that provides for efficient, rapid review and implementation of a remedial and compliant map. So now with these flaws revealed and articulated, I'd like to turn this presentation over to our deputy political director, Colin Marazzi, to tell us about the specific solutions that the Citizens Not Politician Amendment offers to these problems. Well, thank you so much, Freda. And hello, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to spend the next couple minutes talking about how the Citizens Not Politicians Amendment will achieve fair districts for all Ohioans and keep us from reliving the nightmares of the past. Um, first and foremost is the creation of the 15-member Ohio Citizens Redistricting Commission. As we've seen, when one party controls the redistricting process, bad outcomes will follow. So to achieve fair outcomes, we need to level the playing field. We do that by creating a 15-member Citizens Commission with equal numbers of Republicans, Independents, and Democrats, where Ohio citizens apply to serve and go through a rigorous vetting process. Applicants are required to disclose partisan affiliation, potential conflicts of interest, employment history, and political contributions, etc. Um, 
this is to ensure that members of each caucus on the commission are actually good faith actors and not some red herring. These applications are then reviewed by a bipartisan four judge panel of retired judges. Now we know the credibility of these retired judges is so crucial. So we took special care to ensure that only the most qualified and unbiased judges serve on this panel. In order to serve, retired judges must disclose any conflicts of interest and attest that they will operate in an unbiased, neutral manner, essentially as fact finders. And it's important to note that retired judges are still bound by judicial ethics laws and can face professional discipline should they violate these constitutional mandates. Uh, to select the bipartisan four-judge panel, the appointed members of the Ohio Ballot Board will choose eight judges that match their party affiliation. And then the opposite party's members on the ballot board will select two judges that serve on the panel. Essentially, we have the Democrats choosing Republican judges and Republicans choosing Democratic judges. This method of selecting the four-judge panel uses the political ambitions of the legislative members of the ballot board to our advantage. And this is the only time any elected official will play a role in forming the citizen commission. Once the commissioner applications are reviewed, they are either sorted into three buckets, Republican, Independent, or Democratic, or excluded from the pool altogether if they have disqualifying attributes, which we'll get into. A total of 90 applicants are selected, 30 R's, 30 I's, and 30 D's. From that pool of 90, six members are then selected at random, making sure that two each come from the different partisan pools. Once those six members are randomly selected, they are then charged with forming and selecting the remaining nine members of the commission by a majority vote where at least one member of each partisan pool votes for that member. Uh, this 15 member commission must approximately match the demographic and geographic representation of the state. So we have a good picture of all of Ohioans. The remaining applicants that weren't selected to serve on the commission will remain available to serve as alternates. So that's step one. Step two is very simple. Ban current and former politicians, political party officials, and lobbyists. As we know, during the last redistricting process, politicians, party bosses, and lobbyists cannot be entrusted to draw our districts in a nonpartisan, unbiased way. Their incentive to cheat is just too great, so we need to cut them out of the process entirely. The Citizens Not Politicians Amendment is explicit. No politician, party official, or lobbyist can serve on the Citizen Commission if they've been elected or appointed in the previous six years, and this includes federal, state, and local office holders. In addition, no commissioner is able to run for public office six years immediately following their time on the commission. And these thoughtful exclusions remove the prime threat to fair districts. Self-serving politicians, party leaders, and lobbyists will not be able to infect the system like we saw in 2021 and 2022. Instead, our districts will be constructed by the citizens of Ohio, by the people who know their communities best and aren't beholden to political deals and insider games. By empowering citizens to draw our district lines, we'll be able to preserve communities of interest and promote fair and competitive elections. Next, I wanna talk about the criteria for actually drawing the districts. The Citizens Not Politicians Amendment simplifies the rules for drawing districts while still ensuring fairness and transparency. We learned during the previous map drawing cycle that politicians will do anything they can to rig our districts in their favor. The new criteria is very simple. Districts mu must match within an allowable range the partisan preferences of Ohio voters. The residents of current elected officials cannot be considered. This is often called incumbent protection. Um, and districts shall preserve communities of interest as best as possible. Importantly, a geographic region's previous partisan election results do not constitute a community of interest. We saw this argument used time and again in 2021 and 2022, 
as justification for cracking and packing specific geographic areas. The criteria included in the Citizens Not Politicians Amendment were specifically designed to end this kind of discriminatory line drawing based on voters' party affiliation. Next, the transparency and open accountability measures. Drawing our legislative district should be an open, transparent process where Ohioans can give meaningful input. Too often, redistricting can fall victim to backroom deal-making or strong-arm tactics or exacting political retribution. And sadly, this leaves the people of Ohio forgotten and ignored. The Citizens Not Politicians Amendment defends against this by including transparency requirements and accountability measures in the event someone breaks their charge to operate openly and in public view. Commission members are forbidden from discussing any aspects of map drawing outside of public hearings. And if they do, there's a built-in process to remove that commissioner and replace them with an alternate. Same is true for the four judge panel, as well as court appointed special masters. And lastly, I wanna talk about litigation and finality. As Freda mentioned, perhaps the most frustrating aspect of the previous round of map making was the endless carousel we found ourselves in. We won seven diff different legal challenges for both state legislative and congressional maps. Our current redistricting process does not have finality and the politicians who controlled that process knew that. Until we fix this, we will be unable to hold politicians accountable when they game the system or wait out the clock. That's why the Citizens Not Politicians Amendment has an explicit process for any legal challenges to any map passed by the Citizen Commission. First, it's important to note that the exclusion of politicians and political party bosses from serving on the commission should greatly reduce the need for litigation. We've seen when honest actors have the ability to draw new district lines, we do not see the process break down like we did in 2021 and 2022. However, should litigation happen, there is a specific process for how legal challenges brought under the amendment will proceed, and more importantly, how they will end. Under the Citizens Not Politicians Amendment, should a map passed by the commission be found to be unconstitutionally gerrymandered, the Ohio Supreme Court will grant the Citizens Commission another try at fixing the map's issues. If the commission fails, either by not fixing the problems or by passing another non-compliant map, the court will direct two special masters to narrowly alter the commission passed map to bring that map into compliance. Once the court signs off on the special master's alterations, that map is final and unappealable. This process gives the commission the first bite at the apple to fix any mistakes, but recognizes that Ohioans deserve finality in this process. Uh, and it should also be mentioned that this finality will keep Ohioans from having to foot the bill for a $20 million special August election like we did in 2022, after politicians couldn't pass a constitutional map for the traditional May primary. So next, I'm going to pass it over to our organizing director, Elizabeth Chastine Day, to hear about how our action teams and volunteers across the state are plugging into the signature collection efforts. Thank you, Colin. Um, again, thank you all for being here. My name is Elizabeth, my pronouns are she, her, and I have the distinct joy of leading our organizing team. For those of you who aren't familiar with what organizing is or how we do it in the context of the ACLU, the ballot initiative is a perfect example of how organized volunteers help us get to scale and help us maintain power in our state. Right now, we're discussing citizens, not politicians, this is an attempt to protect the everyday Ohio voter from the power that the politicians have to make sure that they choose their voters, not the other way around. We need to have hundreds of thousands of conversations with millions of voters in the state of Ohio. We need to make sure that we're knocking on doors, that we're collecting signatures in public locations, that we're talking to our friends and our neighbors about citizens, not politicians, and the efforts to end gerrymandering in our state. That happens through organized people. We like to think about power as organized money, which Cindy will talk about soon, and organized people, which I'm here to talk about. Right now, 
we are in the process of collecting up to and over 700,000 signatures. This is an effort to make sure that we qualify to be on the ballot, which we will know in July. We need to make sure that we've got roughly 413,000 valid signatures to qualify. So that means 700,000 conversations with 700,000 people who understand why redistricting is so important, who understand the power that a representative and fair democracy holds for our state, and who understand the impact of having one-on-one -on -one conversations with their neighbors, their friends, and the general public here in Ohio. I was looking through the list of folks who are here today and I noticed a few familiar names. I know several of you who helped collect signatures last year when we were working on the Reproductive Freedom Ballot Initiative. I know you have the experience of what power you feel when you're having conversations with people out in the streets asking them to collect or asking them to sign a petition, asking them to vote their values. You understand how it is powerful and how it is effective. I wanted to talk briefly about what we did last year. I think Ben alluded to this, but I really wanna drive home that this is the final act as we're calling it. We had act number one, which was protecting reproductive rights. We had act number two, which was that delightful, surprising August 8th special election last year that the OGA attempted to change the way that we do ballot initiatives and the people's process here in our state. We defeated that. We won on issue one last year, resoundingly. People support abortion access in our state. And now we are trying to make sure that we can hedge our bets and have fair districts. We know that this has been a monumental fight. And we see this as three parts. Again, the first parts were last year. And this, we hope, can once and for all make sure that we fix our state and our state is representative of its people, not representative of its government. We can only do this by mobilizing, again, hundreds of thousands of volunteers to talk to millions of people. Last year, we were able to make 3 million voter contacts. Over the course of six months, we formally started collecting signatures on April 1st, and we ended signature collection in mid-June. We started persuasion, making sure that we were talking to our friends and neighbors and allies about abortion access and reproductive care in August. And by November, we had reached enough people to vote yes on this issue. We are doing the same thing this year, reflecting the same muscle, except we have the blessing of having started a little bit earlier so the frenzied pace we were working with last year is not the pace that we're working with this year, but the importance and the weight of this moment is the same. Here's how you can get involved. Taiwo Mack is actually on this call. Taiwo is our Columbus organizer. Taiwo has petition pickups every other week in the Columbus office. She also has petition trainings on how to circulate a petition every other week in the Columbus office as well. We mobilize what's called the action team. The action team is a multi-thousand person network of supporters for the ACLU spread out across our state. We've got representation in the five different regions, Northwest, Northeast, Central, Southeast Ohio, and Southwest Ohio. You can click the link, Selena, if you could drop that in the chat if you haven't already to sign up for our action team. You'll get Insider details about what's happening, what we're mobilizing around, the bills that we're working on, the ballot initiatives that we're working on. You'll get invites to your local county level action team meetings. A lot of those are in person and you'll be able to meet new volunteers and meet people who have the same values and concerns as you. You will also get activated. We are coming up on the March primary here in exactly a week. We're mobilizing and pulling locations across the state to collect signatures and talk to voters. Again, those of you who collected last year know the importance of having those conversations face-to-face -face with people. They remember them when it comes time in November to vote. So please make sure you sign up for the action team to get activated, and we'll drop the link in the chat for you to sign up for our March 19th primary 
polling push where you can pick a shift or maybe two if you're feeling randy and collect signatures with us at the polling location that you choose in your neighborhood. I am now going to send it over to our development director, Cindy Tom, who will speak about additional ways that you could directly support the campaign and the ACLU of Ohio's commitment to the cause. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Hi again, Cindy Tom, she, her pronouns, development director, kind of also known as the organizer of money, I suppose. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the power of money. As you can see, we are operating on all cylinders for this campaign, similarly to the way that we worked in order to secure the two wins that Elizabeth referenced last year in August and in November. And while November 2024 does feel like it's a little bit away from now, we are anticipating an incredible outpouring of aggressive opposition to our work to establish a process towards fair districts. The ultimate power of Ohio politicians is under threat. And the one certain thing that we know is how hard they will fight to destroy our efforts. So I know that many of you are already supporters of us at the ACLU of Ohio Foundation, our tax deductible 501c3 arm, and for that we are super thankful. However, today, it is, if it is possible for you to make a, a non-tax deductible contribution, we urge you to do that. I'm asking you to consider making an additional gift to our 501c4 arm the entity that allows us to legally work on ballot measures. With C4 funds, the ACLU of Ohio can carry out nonpartisan political and electoral work to bring voters along on this journey with us in direct support of this constitutional amendment. We need to pull together as citizens, not as politicians, to raise the funds to do this really important and necessary work to win in November. One impactful way that you can contribute is by giving a monthly gift. Every dollar counts. And um, I believe that link will be dropped into the, um, the chat for you. And every single dollar counts. Um, even a small contribution monthly would be super helpful for us. We The power of C4 dollars is immeasurable. So with the support, you will help us to engage in campaigns like this and in future campaigns to make this great state our state of Ohio. Again, thank you all for coming tonight. It was great to see some of your names in the chat. I, I wish I could have seen your faces, but I will turn it back over to Selena. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you to all of our panelists. We do have a couple questions. So our first question is from Jim, and he said, does this petition address only state offices or does it also address federal offices? legislative and congressional districts. So I'm going to pass that to Colin for an answer for Jim's question. Yeah, sure thing. And thank you, Jim, for the uh, for the question. Um, the Citizens Not Politicians Amendment deals with both state legislative and congressional representatives. Um, that was a deliberate choice. We wanted to be able to do this uh, all in one fell swoop because we know how how grueling and difficult and exhausting these kinds of campaigns are. We were confident that we could write this amendment language in a way that it could be um, applied to both state legislative and congressional, while also uh, you know, meeting the single subject requirement for uh, constitutional amendments. Um, so when Citizens Not Politicians does pass in November, uh, the commission will be charged with drawing two uh, di uh, two different sets of maps for the state legislature and also uh, for Congress. Uh, it's important to know that, yes, we focus on, you know, our state legislative uh, uh, elections and, and districts, but the congressional uh, districts are equally as important. Um, I think we all know that here on this call. Um, and hopefully, you know, having these fair districts, you know, from Ohio, as well as other states that have passed citizen commissions like Michigan and Colorado and Arizona, we can see uh, a shift away from this race to the bottom uh, in redistricting across the country where, uh, you know, constant lawsuits, constant changing maps, and we can actually just have fair districts, a final decision, so Ohioans can move on and have faith in their representation, both in Columbus and in Washington. Great, thank you, Colin. And our next question is from an anonymous attendee, but it's a very good question. I think a lot of people out in Ohio might be thinking right now, given the past few rounds of redistricting. So 
When the U.S. Supreme Court justices won't even disclose conflicts of interest, how do we have faith that this panel will be made up of, quote, good faith judges that you were speaking to, Colin? So I'm not sure if you or Freda want to each take a stab at that. Well, I'm happy to start. Um, and Freda, please feel free to jump in um, if you'd like. Um, I think that there are enough parameters around the selection of these judges, the criteria that they must uh, meet in order to serve that will uh, allow for um, picking these good faith actors. And I think it's really three separate reasons why I, I feel this way. First and foremost, it's retired judges that are, will be serving in this capacity, not active judges. And in Ohio, it's actually a part of our constitution that once a judge retires, most often it's from our age limit that's built in our into our constitution. So in Ohio, once a judge reaches the age of 70, they're unable to run for re-election in any judicial election thereafter. So for these retired judges who have aged out, there's no you know, greener pastures following their participation on the panel. Um, they are strictly there to serve, again, as fact finders and as uh, individuals to help steward this selection process through, and they'd be basing frankly, their professional credibility on their ability to act in an unbiased, nonpartisan fashion. The second reason I think so is because what I talked about when we're using legislative ambition to our advantage. And what I mean by that is when there's a pool of these retired judges who have applied, who have disclosed any potential conflicts of interest, who have sworn that they have not had communications with uh, political uh, members of the legislature or party officials or lobbyists, um, once they submit their application, the legislative members of the Ohio Ballot Board will undoubtedly use their most scrupulous methods possible to kind of root out and, and, and dig through the applicants of the retired judges to make sure that they are not choosing a bad faith actor. This is what I mean when I say we'll use their political ambition to our advantage, because we are relying on the legislative partisan members of the ballot board to choose the other party's judge. This creates an incentive for them, again, to act rigorous in their investigation of these retired judges. And the more rigorous they act, the more faithful and honestly better they will act on the, be on the behalf of all Ohioans. And lastly, what I think is, you know, Ohio retired, Ohio's retired judges, again, are still subject to professional discipline and Ohio's laws and canons of judicial conduct. They have sworn an oath to uphold the Constitution and to act faithfully and unpartisanly and non-biased. So when we are asking these judges to do that, they are being charged with a, with a significant responsibility and one that I think retired judges, and keep in mind, we're talking about local retired judges, your county common pleas judge, a local municipal court judge, not career politicians who are running, you know, potentially for um, other office. Uh, these are people who serve their local communities faithfully and people who, uh, again, are charged to operate in a manner that, you know, is unbiased, but also in a way that will keep them from coming under the microscope of professional disciplinary bodies in Ohio. I would only add one thing to Colin's very excellent explanation. Um, there's a lot of objective criteria that the judges need to apply in order to select um, this first large group of 90 um, from the applicants. Um, it's very objective. It's very rigorous. It um, keeps out people whose grandchild has has run for office. It, it, it's, it, it, people are very distanced from any involvement at all in politics. And even on top of all those objective criteria, um, there's screen upon screen, and there is a random draw that injects randomness in it. So even the judges do not have control over the outcome. So it, the, the process is well designed to keep um, political choice out of it. Thank you, Freda and Colin. We have a follow-up question on this from Logan, who's wondering how, how we know the past party affiliation of the judges who are eligible. 
Well, as, as Freda mentioned, there's objective criteria that these retired judges will need to provide in order to be considered to be selected to be on this panel. Part of that objective criteria will be, what is your party affiliation? What, part, what partisan primaries have you voted in to establish that record? Now, should a judge have voted um, an issues only ballot throughout the entirety of their career? You know, there are other tools that we can look to and, and uh, that will be used to determine their affiliation, any political contributions, any sort of endorsements that they have previously made. But also, again, we're relying on the opposing parties, legislative members of the Ohio ballot board to do some of this investigation. You know, if they see that a retired judge, as a pure example, hails from, say, Logan County, I would imagine that legislative members of that ballot board uh, would contact their party uh, counterparts in Logan County to ask, what's this judge's reputation? How have they operated? Um, and they have an apparatus, a party apparatus, to do these investigations to make sure that we understand and, and we know what the partisan affiliation of these retired justices are. Again, I don't mean to uh, be a broken record, but using this political ambition of the ballot board members to our advantage is one of, I think, the, um, the best aspects of uh, the Citizens Not Politicians Amendment. Because, again, it puts their ambition in service of us, the citizens of Ohio. Wonderful. Thank you, Colin. We have what looks like one final question in the chat, and I believe this will be for Cindy to answer. It's a question about how donations made to the National ACLU can get to the affiliates and how someone should make a first-time donation if they want it to come to the Ohio affiliate. Thank you for the question. I love a good question about donating. Bring them on. Um, what I would say is that um, as part of our affiliate structure, giving to national or giving to our affiliate directly, it's all shared. We have a really strong um, sort of system of sharing funds across all affiliates and national so that we can all be strong across the country. So um, unless there's a specific piece of work that you want to fund within our affiliate, I would just say go ahead and donate at the link or donate how you typically do. And I just also want to lift up again that um, a C4 gift, if tax deduction does not matter to you, is so much more meaningful to us in that we have a lot of freedom to do this really deep nonpartisan political work. So I will drop my email into the chat. So um, whoever asked that question, if you have any further questions about where to donate and how it will be used, I can certainly have a um, more individualized conversation with you. But either way, if you donate to National or to our affiliate, it is all shared. Thank you, Cindy. And thank you again to Ben, Colin, Elizabeth, and Freda. This was a really, really helpful conversation about citizens, not politicians. Thank you to everyone who attended tonight. We will be following up via email with all of these links that we dropped and all of the ways that you can plug into the campaign. And this recording will be available on our social media and our YouTube channel later this week. Thank you, everyone. Have a great evening. Bye.